or Saturday night. Uh, today's sermon is going to be called Spiritual Wellness Checklist for 2021. And, you know, you think, you think of a wellness checklist, I want to give you kind of a, well, I don't know if it would be funny or not, but at my job, as a teacher, one of my new rules in 2020 that was definitely different than what I'm used to is working the front door at the school as the kids come in. And as the kids come into school, they have to go through this chute. It feels like TSA, to be completely honest. I feel like I'm working at an airport. I'm like, welcome to Greenville Area School District. And you may come through the chute now. And uh, one of the responsibilities of this job is to operate the thermal scanner and to determine kids' temperatures. We have a checklist. If you're feeling like this, this, or this, I'm going to send you home. And some of the kids go through and they don't have a temperature. They're like, oh, I have to stay in school. And so, and so they go through. And uh, one funny thing happened. This is probably the third day. And we, got, we combined. We have like our fifth grade up with the rest of the high schoolers. They're not used to being up there. And this one kid came in. And all he wanted to do was eat breakfast. And he always forgets to take his face shield off. And it doesn't scan him when the face shield doesn't go off. So he goes through. It misses him. One of the operators is like, hey, you didn't get that kid. And I was like, hey, you with the black backpack. And he takes off and starts sprinting into the cafeteria. And I'm like, just instinctively, I said to the school resource officer, I'm like, we got a runner. And so I just chased him down. And uh, we got him. And, and I mean, poor kid. I, I didn't mean to react like that. I made it sound like he did something heinously bad. But so, you know, as teachers, we're, we're all kind of probably tired of, of hearing about the wellness, but but one important wellness checklist we shouldn't neglect is the one that John gives us in the um, in his book or general epistle of First John. He, he gives us kind of a guide guide, if you will, to determine our spiritual healthiness. I think that's the right word I'm looking for there. So if you could turn with me to the book of First John, chapter one, there was a quote I found from one of the founding fathers, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was. George Washington's personal physician, as you're turning there, he says this, the Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in his present state than any other book in the world. And, and that means that the Bible has, you know, what he was talking about there, the hardships that they went through in the early days of our country, the Bible has all of the resources necessary to teach us how to grow spiritually and that's going to be the focus of today. And I want to tie this into last week because last week we looked at 2 Corinthians 5.17. For those of you who joined us online or were here, we talked about the idea of the newness of life. We said that those of us who are in Christ are a new creation, brand new. And we said that in 2 Corinthians 5 last week that Paul has set forth for us the goal of living for Jesus Christ because we have a newness of life, we need to live in that newness of life. And that should be our goal for 2021. Now, in order to complete that goal that we discussed last week, one of the keys is that we have to be able to pass a spiritual wellness check, if you will. And what we see in 1 John chapter 1, uh, if you'll read with me in verses 1 through 9, we see just that that John presents. Notice what it says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and hands have handled, concerning the word of life, obviously talking about Christ, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, and that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now catch this last part. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so these are the words we're going to be learning from today from uh, John. But one thing, I, I want to just introduce this with a little bit of history, but one really super important thing to understand is this. 
All Christians have eternal life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Everybody, uh, as a Christian, has been given that free gift because we believe in Jesus for it. But the thing is, while all Christians may have eternal life, not all Christians have fellowship with Christ. All Christians may be uh, born again, but not all Christians may have a close relationship with Christ. And that's the key thing that John is going to lay out for us in the epistle of 1 John. And, and so what we see, I'm going to give you a little bit of a historical background just so you can understand uh, a little bit about what John was trying to do here. But according to tradition, John wrote this particular book towards the end of his life. This would be around 90 to 95 AD. And that's according to uh, early church tradition. But there's also some internal evidence to suggest that as well within the epistle. And this was written as a general epistle, meaning he's not like writing like Peter did to a particular group of people scattered in certain regions. He's writing generally to Christians at this time period, and he's writing to combat a false teaching called Gnosticism. If you've heard of Gnosticism, there's too much to it to really cover right now in such a brief time, but Gnosticism is a humongous uh, teaching in this particular time period, and it was a false teaching. Basically, to sum it up in very short and simple terms, they taught that one could have a higher knowledge of God through philosophy. They taught that one could have a higher knowledge of God through human reason, through different aspects. But you see, John, as he said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, he was with Jesus in person. And so John understands and is acquainted very well with the Word of God, and he shows us the proper way to have fellowship with God. Gnostics thought that you could attain fellowship with God through some higher understanding. John is going to tell his believers that he's writing to the way that you can have true relationship and fellowship with Christ and not Gnosticism. Gnosticism not being the answer. So it's from 1 John chapter 1 that we're going to discover three important checkboxes, if you will, to determine if you have spiritual wellness in your current time in which you're living and how we can get to that point in 2021. And so just join me in a brief word of prayer as we uh, commit this uh, reading of uh, the word again to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for what uh, the Apostle John has written here to the, in the general epistle. Lord, some of these words and, and, and interpretation are difficult, Lord. But I pray, God, that you would give us all spiritual eyes and, and hearts of understanding so that we can break down this word and understand it. Though it may be difficult at times, we understand that there are important principles that you want us to learn. And we pray, God, that we would gather those things from your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so look with me at verse 4 of 1 John chapter 1, and I'll tell you what our first checkbox is. It says this, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So the purpose, remember, the purpose of 1 John, especially chapter 1, he's not writing to, so that we know we have eternal life, whether we're really saved or not. His goal with this particular chapter is to see if we have a relationship, to see what our relationship is like with God, and for the purpose of our joy being complete. Or full, And so the first aspect, and, and this does seem maybe like a bit of common sense, but the first checkbox is, of course, and I hope we all meet this criterion, to have spiritual wellness, we must have eternal life. Of course, that's the obvious first thing. In order to have spiritual wellness of, of, at all, you have to be spiritually regenerated, which is partly what we talked about last week. To have spiritual wellness, you have to have spiritual life. And we saw this last week in our reading of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But notice what it says in verse 1 and 2. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. So John was with Jesus on earth, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Now notice, John is the last surviving apostle at this point. And he is speaking at, as a direct witness to the earthly ministry of Christ. Now notice the second part. Notice there might be like a dash or a hyphen. So this is like a side note that John is saying. This isn't the main idea, but this is a side note. It says, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, 
which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So John is writing to Christians here. He's not writing to pseudo-Christians or people who aren't saved. This is meant to be a general letter for people who already possess eternal life. And so this is an assumption of John. The assumption is that they already saved. They already have eternal life. They've already believed in Jesus and received the free gift of everlasting life. Now, according to John MacArthur, while I may disagree with some of his theology, he is a phenomenal historian and has some really interesting notes. He says this about the Apostle John, the last living apostle. He says he was the sole remaining uh, apostolic survivor who had intimate eyewitness association with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. Remember, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. John lived in Ephesus in Asia Minor, this is in his later life, carrying out an extensive evangelistic program, overseeing many of the churches that had arisen and conducting an extensive writing ministry. Papias, who was an early church father, said this describing the Apostle John. He described him as a living and abiding voice. And so John wasn't worshipped or revered in that way by these churches, but he was seen kind of like, I mean, almost just like a celebrity, but you have to watch those things. Obviously, the early church had to combat against those kinds of things. But everybody was like anxious to talk to the Apostle John. He would visit these churches. He would oversee these churches because he was the last living apostle. He understood what it meant to have a close fellowship with Christ. Remember, his responsibility was to take care of Mary after the death of Christ. We presume that Joseph was dead at that particular time when Christ was crucified. And so it was left up to John to take care of uh, Mary, who had been widowed. And so we see John lived a very important life. Jesus entrusted his mother with John. And so we understand that John is uniquely qualified to, to write to us about the idea of having this close, intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. And so I want you to actually look back with me at John 20, 31. So, so you, you might be saying to yourself, well, uh, with this whole idea of fellowship, so first John's written about fellowship. Uh, he does mention eternal life. Uh, when does he mention eternal life or how to get eternal life? If you go to John chapter 20, I want to read a couple verses to you. I think my dad, one of us, had mentioned these particular verses in a sermon. But these are super important. Because while 1 John is written primarily for fellowship or relationship growing with Christ, the Gospel of John, which again was the last of the four Gospels written around 90 AD, this is after much controversy in the church over how one gets saved. Do we follow the works of the law? John affirms that faith alone in Christ alone for his promise of everlasting life is how we have that life. Notice what he says in John 20, 30, and 31. It says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so the Gospel of John is unique in the Bible. It is the only evangelistic book in the Bible. That's not to say that other books don't mention eternal life, that they don't mention you know, what, how we believe and have eternal life. But the sole purpose of John is that it is written to unbelievers so that they might read this book and have eternal life. So make no mistake about it. Eternal life was a big deal for the Apostle John. But his thing is, in 1 John, he assumes that his audience already has everlasting life, that they've already believed. But that's why, if you go back to 1 John 1, 2... That's why he talks about in 1 John 1, 2, the life that was manifested and declared to you that eternal life which was with the Father, Father and was manifested to us. That's why he merely puts eternal life here as almost seemingly like a bit of a side note. It's because this is something that he has already addressed with these particular churches and believers in which he was ministering to in the latter part of his life. But there's one thing I want you to understand before we get to our uh, second point here, our second checkbox, is that eternal life, and as I, I mentioned this, I believe, in a sermon a while back, eternal life is a gift. And you think of a gift, what good is a gift that someone gives you and you don't open it up? I mean, if you have a gift that someone gets you, like if I, I, 
I have a beard. If someone gets me a really nice razor so I can finally trim this thing down, which I already have some razors, but just go with my example here. And, and I get this nice gift, this nice pretty wrapping paper and stuff. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. This is awesome. It's mine. I possess this object. Well, what good is that razor going to do me if I just leave it in the box and don't even unwrap it? It's not going to do me any good. It's still mine. If someone comes into the house and takes it unlawfully, they're stealing. They stole my property. But ultimately, that razor ain't going to do me any good. I said eight. Uh, that is a word now, I'm pretty sure. But it's not going to do me any good if I don't open it up and actually use it. And that's the thing that John is trying to convey here in 1 John chapter 1. He assumes that they have eternal life. He's like, yeah, you have eternal life. That's awesome. You're, you're a believer. But what good is it going to do you if you don't grow that relationship? It's like unwrapping a gift. And Charles Stanley uses that analogy in one of his messages. He talks about the idea of growing in fellowship with Christ as unwrapping the gift and enjoying the quality of eternal life more and more. Okay, so the big thing I want you to understand here, in order to have fellowship or relationship with Christ, we must have eternal life. Now, now notice this. It says in verse 3 of 1 John chapter 1, that which we have heard, uh, that which we have heard, seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In verse 4, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So the idea is not just eternal life as a possession, but eternal life as a quality. And that's going to be getting into our second point here, but that's the big emphasis that John mentions. So the first checkbox is, do you have eternal life? If you don't, then today is the day of your salvation. Jesus says, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That's the first part. The second part of this, we're going to be looking a little bit closer at verse 3 and 4, is to have, or the second checkbox, if you will, <clears throat> to have spiritual wellness, we must have fellowship. And my dad and I talk about this a lot in studies. Pastor Dave talks about this. What is the idea of fellowship? We just read this in verse 3. It says, the purpose is that you may have fellowship with us. That particular Greek word is Greek word 2842, and the word is koinonia. <clears throat> you might have heard that. Uh, pretty sure it's mentioned in some Christian songs, koinonia. And that word means relationship. In the basic sense, it means intimacy. And that's the key thing. It's not even just having a relationship. It's having an intimate relationship or understanding. Think of like a very close friendship, those types of aspects. And so we see that the point is we don't just, we're not just born again as, as, as children of God, it's that we're born again and then we grow our relationship. And, and you think of relationships. Relationships take work. Friendships take work. You know, my friend and I, we text all the time. We do those types of things. We don't necessarily get to see each other all the time. But if you're going to have a friendship or even you know, think of like a relationship with somebody, you could talk about dating or friendship. It takes effort, it takes communication, and it takes work. If we're never spending time with Christ, if we're never doing the things that he's instructing us in, how can we have fellowship? How can we have relationship? How can we have a relationship to grow if there's nothing there, if we're not making any sort of effort? Notice what John 10.10 uh, 10 says. I should have had you put a bookmark in John. I feel like you should do that because yeah, we are going back. So let <laughs> me put a bookmark in the Gospel of John. Gospel of John 10.10. 10. And so just as John is written primarily so that you'll believe to have eternal life, he mentions fellowship in, in, in this particular gospel as well. And, and we see this outlined very perfectly within the, the passage or the parable of the shepherd and the sheep. Notice what he says in John 10.10. 10. He says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now notice the second part. I have come that they may have life. That's the free gift. That's what you believe in Jesus for. And that they may have it more abundantly. And so we see here the difference. There's principle number one, which is the, the checkbox we did there, having eternal life. But then there's a second aspect of this many Christians sadly forget. Is that Jesus wants us to have life more abundantly. That's a relationship that leads to joy inexpressible. And that's what 1 John chapter 1, verse 4 means. And, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And so the point is that John is trying to get across is that we shouldn't just be satisfied with having the possession of eternal life. 
We should want a better quality of eternal life, which comes through a better relationship with Christ. And, and obviously our third principle is going to be how do we grow that relationship. But the second principle is we must have fellowship. Now, how do we know if we have fellowship? We have to examine ourselves. The Apostle Paul tells us to examine ourselves. J John, in fact, if you go back <clears throat> into uh, 1 John chapter 1, he tells us a little bit about the concept of losing fellowship. And, and you heard me correctly. You can, you can lose your fellowship or relationship, uh, intimacy with Christ, but you cannot lose eternal life. Eternal life is permanent. Amen. John 5, 24 through 27 makes it very clear. If you have eternal life, you have it now. You have passed from death to life. But we must understand the warning, though, that even as eternal life is secure and permanent, and we affirm eternal security here at South High Community Church, we can, as Christians, lose fellowship. And that's a scary thought. And that's a place we, none of us want to be in, of course, we understand how does this happen? Well, he gives us the answer in verse 5 of 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> it says this, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So stop right there. God is the ultimate good. God is the ultimate um, standard of what good is. You know, you think of like, uh, what was it, back in England, they had the old meter bar. And you knew what a meter was. Because it was a, a, an objective quality of measurement. You could measure any standard, like if you got a meter stick, you could measure it with the meter bar in England. And that was an absolute standard for what a meter is. Well, God is the objective standard for what goodness is. He is the ultimate good. And so we understand here that verse 5, in him is light. Light is the perfect righteousness of God. And in him is no darkness, no evil. Now notice what verse 6 says. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And so we understand here we can lose fellowship with Christ by walking in darkness. And notice what, in fact, we won't turn here because we did go here last week in last week's message, but Ephesians 4.17, Paul urges the church of Ephesus to no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So the principle is, by walking in the flesh, by walking as the world walks, we are capable of breaking our relationship or friendship, intimacy with Christ. We can break fellowship by doing that. Notice what James says. If you go over to James chapter 4, verse 4. Now remember, James is writing to Christians. He's writing to Jewish believers who were scattered after the persecution of Christians by Saul. He's writing to Christians who were scattered after the stoning of Stephen. Remember, Saul basically chased the Christians out of Jerusalem. And these Christians, many of with which were, were questioning whether they wanted to stay with it or not. They wanted to stay in the faith. Now notice what James says here. It's a very strict warning. This is for believers. He says, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so we understand that this ties right in with what John is saying. When we're friends with the world, when we live in the flesh and accept the things that the world offers, we're making ourselves an enemy of God, and that hurts our relationship with Christ. Because why? Verse 5 of 1 John chapter 1 in him is no darkness. And so therefore, he can't have fellowship with darkness. And so when we choose to walk in the flesh and walk in darkness, we are hurting our relationship with Christ. And in fact, if you read in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it describes the world system. It says in verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. These are the things that we need to be on guard for. These are the things that we need to watch. These are the things that, that hurt our fellowship and our relationship with Christ. Now, I want to share with you in a second. Now, this is maybe stepping on some toes, but this, I argue, is a very big one for Christians. I think that this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks that many of us face for blocked fellowship. There's many things that can block or hurt our relationship and fellowship with Christ, but this undoubtedly is one of the big ones because Jesus mentions it very specifically. If you go to Matthew chapter 6, 
So obviously sin, the sin that so easily entangles us, walking in the world is one thing. But I want to share with you another thing that will block our fellowship. Because Jesus uses very uh, strong language here. This is obviously in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, this is right after the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew 6, 14, starting in 6, 14. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And so what we understand, positionally, we are all blood-bought. Positionally, we are all forgiven. Amen. Positionally, we are all already saved. This particular verse, according to David Jeremiah, is not talking about a positional forgiveness. This is talking about a relational forgiveness. So the idea is, if we are not forgiving people for the things that they've done against us, especially in the church, you think of all the conflicts, not even just like in this church, that I mean, we're talking about like the church in general. If we're not forgiving people who have done us wrong, if we're holding grudges, if we're living with this, this unforgiveness in our hearts, it says that the Father will not forgive our trespasses, not positionally speaking as a child of God, but relationally. It means we cannot have a close relationship with God if we refuse to forgive people of the wrongs that they've done against us. And that's the harsh reality of it. And this is something I think is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for the church today, is the, the divisions, the anger, the resentment that we oftentimes see in the church today, and it hinders our fellowship with Jesus Christ. But we see that there is hope. There is hope. If we go back to 1 John 1, 9, there is absolutely a hope, and that is that fellowship can be restored. Fellowship can be brought back. Though fellowship can be broken, it can be restored, and it's a very simple fix. If you go to 1 John 1, 9, it's my hope to get you guys copy, <clears throat> copies of a sheet I have. It's called Spiritual Rebound, and it's going to cover this very thing. I don't have the copies today, but I'm hoping I'll have them next week. But it covers the idea, if you've been walking out of fellowship, how do you get your heart right with God? And 1 John 1, 9 says this. <clears throat> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We think of the idea of confess. I mean, oftentimes when we sin, we should feel bad if we have a conscience. We should absolutely feel guilty. But when, when John says that we need to confess, the word confess in the Greek simply means agree with God, to have an agreement. And so when it comes to a sin, the moment we look at God's word and, and, and we say to God, I agree with you, what I did was wrong. That's the moment that we're forgiven. When we read God's word, we believe it and say, yes, God, you're right, I'm wrong, I believe, I agree with what your word says about my actions. When you do that, you know, you think of like back in the medieval days when they would commit sins, they would go on these long pilgrimages they used to have in the 1300s with the Black Death, they believed it was caused by some great sin that Europe had committed. They used to go to these uh, churches and have priests beat them with whips and, and clubs and things so that they could make penance to God all this guilt and stuff and, and yes we should feel guilty for our sins but the forgiveness comes when we say God I agree with you in your word and I don't agree with what my sin nature is telling me about this particular sin the moment you believe that and you confess your sin you're forgiven and and, and fellowship is so absolutely important and, and David understood this if you go to Psalm 32 David understood this very well. Remember, David was a man after God's own heart, but David committed adultery. He committed murder. He had Bathsheba's husband put in the front lines where he knew that he would meet certain death. <clears throat> David, of all people, you think of the sins that he committed, but notice what Psalm 32 says. David understood this, and, and obviously David lived a long time before John, but he understood the idea of acknowledging sin. Notice what Psalm 32, verse 1 says. And your, your Bible might say it's a contemplation. <clears throat> it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silence, remember, remember David refused to confess his sin at first. Remember Nathan the prophet had to, had to confront him. Notice what happened when David refused to confess his sin. 
When I kept silent, my bones grew old. Through my groaning all the day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. And so David was being afflicted to some degree with some physical issue because of God, because of his refusal to acknowledge his sin. It says, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Now notice verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The moment he confessed it was the moment he was forgiven. He tried to hide it, and oftentimes we try to do that in this life. We commit a sin, and it's like, I can hide that from God. You think of all the people in the Old Testament that tried to do that. You think of Cain and Abel. You know, my, my brother's keeper, kills his brother, tries to hide it. God knows our sins. And when we confess and agree with his word, our fellowship is restored. And I want to share a quote with you from a Christian uh, philosopher, William Lane Craig, from the Talbot School of Theology. He says this <clears throat> about fellowship. And I think this is super important to understand why this is such a big deal. According to Dr. Craig, he says, God is the fulfillment of human existence. He is the locus of infinite value and love. To know God and to be related to him forever is the end for which human beings were created. And so to know God and to have relationship with him is everything. It's our spiritual growth. It is everything. And so that's why box number two was the largest point I have today, because I really want to emphasize the importance of having fellowship, what fellowship is, how we get it back when we lose it. But principle number three, and the final checkbox on our spiritual wellness list is this. <clears throat> to have spiritual wellness, we must grow in fellowship with God. We must grow in relationship. So it's not just having relationship, it's to grow that relationship. Notice what it says in 1 John 1.7. <clears throat> 1 John 1.7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So we have fellowship with the Father and the Son by walking in the light. Once we restore fellowship after we've sinned, when we walk in the light, we grow that fellowship. Now, what does it mean to walk in the light? Because these are phrases sometimes we just throw around. Notice, again, going back to John, I told you we are going to be there quite a bit. John chapter 4 <clears throat> This is a very important point as John is talking to the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. What does it mean to walk in the light? Well, John explains it in very simple terms here. John 4, 23 says this. He says to the Samaritan woman, But the hour is coming, and now it is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Notice spirit there in verse 24 is little case. Spirit in the previous uh, aspect is a capital. And in verse um, uh, 23, we, we understand how this is working. We see little case in verse 23. Now, if you were here last week and you caught last week's message, you understand a couple aspects of this. Remember John 3, 5, and 6. It says in John 3, 5, and 6, as we discussed last week, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is spirit, little s. And so when we believe in Jesus, we have spiritual regeneration, we have spiritual life. But the point that Jesus is making, I'm going to give you two points here for walking in the light. We must walk in spirit and in truth. The first aspect, spirit, means that now that we've been spiritually regenerated, we have a connection with God, we must be led by His Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 5.18 says that we need to be filled, which means to be influenced by the Spirit. So, worshiping God in spirit and truth starts with the idea of being led by the Spirit of God, influenced by the Spirit of God and not the flesh, influenced by the new nature that we talked about last week that has been brought about by the Spirit of God. The second aspect is the truth. The truth, we're not going to turn here, but John 17, 17 says this, Sanctify them by your truth, thy word is truth. And so we understand that there is a dual component to walking in the light. First of all, we have to be spirit-led, not controlled. The spirit is not like in Star Wars, like an, an inanimate force that's just going to make us do things. We must be influenced by the spirit. And number two, it must be in accordance with what John 17, 17 says. 
It must be in accordance, concordance with his word. And we understand that sanctify them by their truth. Your word is truth in John 17, 17. That means that in order to be brought closer in relationship with Christ, we must listen to his word. We must obey his word through the influencing of the Holy Spirit. That's what John means when he says we must walk in the light as he is in the light. Remember what John 15, 14 says. It says he... Um, Basically, Jesus, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, this is the best of my ability, but it says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So the idea is, in order to be friends with Jesus Christ, we must obey his commandments and be influenced by the Holy Spirit. James 4.4, 4, as we've already read, friendship with the world is enmity with God. If we want to grow our relationship with God, we have to live in the Spirit. We have to read his word and we have to obey it, as John 17.17 17 says. And so that's the kind of worship that God desires, according to John 4. It's the idea of worshiping God in spirit and truth. And the result, if you go back to 1 John chapter 1, the result, notice what it says in verse 7. The result of walking in the light is that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. And that's in terms of relationship, not positionally speaking. That's in terms of relationship. And so we see here some really important principles, guys. First of all, we must have eternal life. The second box that we have to check off is, is there something in my life that is blocking my fellowship? Am I in unforgiveness? Do I have some habitual sin? Am I, uh, do I have wandering eyes with the channels on the TV? Whatever it might be, something that needs to be gotten right with God. Do I need to confess some sin in my life? And then the third principle, we must grow in fellowship with God. And so the point is, the more we obey God's word, the more we're going to grow in relationship. But the more we disobey and the more we disbelieve his word, the worse our relationship is going to be. And we're going to walk farther and farther away from fellowship. And so I would encourage you in the year 2021 to really focus what are some things that are a distraction to my spiritual walk what are some things that I need to get right with God, and how can I stay right with God by putting these things out of my life? How can I walk better in spirit and truth and walk in the light just as he is in the light? But notice the hope, though, and this is the honest reality in verse 10 in closing. It says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And I explained this in Sunday school. If, if, if you're fearful today that you've walked really far out of fellowship, that's not a bad thing. It means that you have a conscience, and it means that you're concerned about it, and chances are you're probably not one of the people that I'm discussing here today. But the idea of the reality is we are all going to sin. We're all going to mess up. But the point is when we sin, we confess immediately. We get back into fellowship, and we walk in fellowship longer than we're not in fellowship. And that's the point. That's how we have spiritual wellness and uh we have this hope, and I would encourage you to read and study First John. It's a very important book for understanding fellowship with Christ. And uh, I'm asking my dad here.